So here I am in Sassfe, Switzerland, pretty tired because I had to get up at stupid o'clock, but also because I went to bed at stupid o'clock. And the reason for that is I was doing some last minute panic reading. Uh, I definitely get the sense that I haven't done my homework. Um, so to give you some background, uh, a couple of months ago I got an email from Chase, the folks who fund my PhD, thank you Chase, asking for proposals to come to one seminar at the European Graduate School. I'll explain a little bit more about the European Graduate School in detail as we go, but uh, essentially that would mean uh, I would get to hang out with an eminent academic, of which they had a huge program, uh, for a few days and be taken through a program relating to work that they are working on currently. So really interesting opportunity. And not only that, but the, uh, the two locations were either Malta or here in Sasfe. And what a privilege to be here. Just look at that. So I thought, wow, what an amazing opportunity. Looked through um, the list of academics and saw Peter Sendi. And at that point, I just had his name. So I uh, put a proposal together based on that. And yeah, lo and behold, lucky me. So essentially, I'm, I'm one of three students who are, are, are guinea pigs, really, in a new partnership between Chase and uh, the EGS. Uh, super exciting, basically. So what happened was, and to clarify my point about the homework, uh, at that point, I just had his uh, name, Peter Sendi, and, and what I knew about him and could find out about him. Then I get through, a couple of weeks later, I get through the, the course program, which is nothing to do with music. <laughs> so Peter Sendi did his PhD in looking at the aesthetics of music and then has written a lot about music and listening, but also veered into um, a whole range of, of stuff to do with philosophy and, and cultural studies. Um, really interesting stuff. So yeah, the, the theme, I think the title is something like The Politics and Erotics of Reading from Plato to Calvino. Uh, and it had a whole list of like 15 major authors. We're talking like for, literally from Plato uh, to recent authors like Calvino uh, via Nietzsche, Schopenhauer, um, even Cervantes, like all kinds of stuff. And then the day before traveling, I finally get through a reading list, which has, has got entire novels on it. It's got it's like way more than you could possibly read in a day. Um, so yeah, I desperately sort of went through that as much as I could. And obviously I had been doing some of my own preparation and homework. However, yeah, I do feel slightly underprepared. Um, and uh, we'll have to see how, how it goes. But what was so lovely is arriving last night, super tired, but going to the dinner. Now everyone uh, eats all together. I'll show you a bit of that uh, later. So I met some more of the students and I met the dean of the school, Chris, and also met Peter. So um, yeah, we'll, we'll hopefully catch up with those as we go. But here we go, anyway, day one. It's hard to imagine a more inspiring setting for the small but well-equipped campus here at the European Graduate School in Sasfe. But anyway, let's get to work. In the first morning session, Petter explained that the idea for the seminar is simply to think together and explore without any necessary goal. 
Our theme was reading, to lend an attentive ear to that inner stage of voices, quasi-voices, sub-vocalizations and experiences that form part of the phenomenology of reading. What happens when we read? Petter identified at least three voices that form part of the minimal structure of political interactions, the micropolitics of the reading stage. First, we have the listener, that part of you who's absorbing the text, or perhaps questioning, interrupting and connecting in some way. Then there's the author, of course, the original voice who created the text. Third, the anagnostes. Reading is an auditory experience, and this is that little voice you hear in your head, simply reading the text aloud to you, like those ancient slaves that are present but not present in classical literature. Finally, there's another kind of voice, or perhaps more of a silent but necessary presence. The reading imperative. It's basically that compelling urge to read and go on reading that is part of the unüberschreiber, or an unovershoutable precondition of reading. There's a kind of hierarchy here, but also a dynamic relationship of harmonies and tensions that connect and diverge in a kind of breathing rhythm, a systoles and diastoles to use the Greek. Anyway, time for lunch, which happens communally here at the Hotel Alalin with a simple but tasty buffet service. The town of Sasfe, by the way, is a small ski resort, so pretty quiet during the EGS summer program. What little I saw of it was really lovely. Back to reading. And those who love reading will know the pure joy of being absorbed in a compelling, sensual flow of reading. This is the erotics of reading an intimate gatheredness, with the author in the role of the ancient Greek Erastus or lover, and the receptive reader as a Romanos or loved one, comparable to pedagogue and pederast. We can have opposite experiences too, of course, like when external imperatives make us read something difficult, disgusting or boring. We considered those and other thoughts in relation to some of our selected authors, but of course it's too much to hope to summarise it all here. So after all that, dinner, in the same format as lunch, all good healthy stuff as you can see. So there you go, that was an overview, a, a taste of day one. And of course, um, the content is so, has been so rich, it's impossible to convey, uh, do justice to the whole range and, and depth of what we covered. And, and I'm completely exhausted now, mentally and physically. So um, that's as far as we're gonna go uh, for today. Plus, the reading imperative is telling me that uh, there is more reading that I need to do before I can sleep. So I'm going to go do that right now. I will see you tomorrow. In day two, we problematized this notion of the reading imperative and also debated issues of access to the linguistic and symbolic realms, referencing the post-colonial questions of Spivak's classic essay, Can the Subaltern Speak?, which in itself is not an easy read. We interrogated issues of gender in the very male group of key readings and explored the particular regime of reading in Hobbes's Leviathan. In the evenings at EGS, there's often a guest lecture open to all students whether they're signed up to a seminar or working independently. This one was by Petter Sandy, considering the compressed and shadowy political economy of images in the digital age, or iconomics as he puts it. It's out on the EGS YouTube channel if you're interested. So that's a highly compressed, blurry, shadowy representation of day two. I guess the other thing I'd want to say really um, at the end of today is that I'm, I'm, I'm getting a real sense of, of the human connection, of course. Being in a class for hours, you know, <laughs> on end, um, plus, six plus hours a day together in a small group, um, discussing and thinking deeply and, and eating together and walking up and down, you know, to the campus from the hotel. Of course, you know, I'm feeling connected to people and I'm going to miss people. I'm going to, um, there's a sense of our, our co-created experience, which is really precious um, as much as it's, you could say it's quite superficial and quite, um, you know, we've only just met and whatnot. And it's a little bit like when you go to a conference or whatever and you, and you meet new people and you feel close to them. But it's deeper than that in this because we really are spending more time and, and, and exploring together. We're going on a journey together. So we're sharing this experience and, I, and I'm going to miss my classmates. I'm going to miss Isaac. I'm going to miss Marcy and McKenna and Jordi and David and Tracy. Uh, and of course, Petter, who's facilitating the class so beautifully and generously and with such warmth and sharing with us his knowledge, but also his sharing his questions with us to explore and think with us. That is, what a privilege. Um, so I'll miss everyone and I hope that these relationships can continue. Yeah, 
got one more day. I'm sad that I only have one more day here, but, um, but yeah, anyway, that's day two and uh, see you tomorrow. So Robert, the three dollar violin, amazing project. Thank you so much for your talk last night and mm -hmm. I'm super inspired to hear about it. Can you give us a quick summary of what it is? A quick summary, the idea was to make a conservatory quality instrument for children out of recycled, upcycled, donated and harvested materials um, that the total cost of production would be three dollars. Amazing. Um, this does not include labor. Sure. I'm working with the Cambridge Department of Engineers um, in order to work out some of the technical details in order to do production without computers mm -hmm. and um, using some machines from the 50s and different technologies. Amazing. Um, it's all based on the Chano um, Stradivari from 1726, uh -huh. which is a guitar-shaped instrument, a okay. bit unusual, mm -hmm. and um, but has all sort of Baroque techniques combined with super high-end modern um, 3D modeling. Amazing. Yes. And the idea being that eventually you'll be able to essentially hand over the, the means of production, the ways of creating this instrument to folks that don't have exactly. access to yeah. high level instruments, yeah. etc. So I've been running a charity for the last 25 years that gives away instruments in developing communities mm -hmm. that have established music programs. Mm -hmm. Often what's missing is a good quality instrument. Mm -hmm. And um, so we work in Argentina and the Philippines, a program in India, um, the Upper East Side in New York and mm -hmm. East Harlem. Um, we're looking into programs in South London Amazing. and um, various other places around the world mm -hmm. where underserved communities need access to music education so cool. and the tools to make that happen. Awesome. This is one of the tools. So why have you come to here, to Saspe in Switzerland in the mountains? <laughs> um, I'm a professor at EGS in any case mm -hmm. and I've been lecturing here for a few years now and I love the community. Mm. Um, for me this is a laboratory, this is the test case. Mm -hmm. I wanted to see if it's possible to assemble the instrument on site because mm -hmm. the idea is that the finished instrument will actually be created by the musician and their families. Uh -huh. um, so parts will arrive and they'll be assembled and finished by students and musicians and um, EGS I wanted to be the laboratory mm -hmm. for this project it's a perfect place to do it mm. because I'm interested not only in problems of production mm -hmm. and technique but also in problems of thinking around it mm -hmm. um, it's a complex project there are many economic elements many issues and uses related to technology mm -hmm. um, to what degree we incorporate that or refuse to mm -hmm. and um, a lot of those are philosophical issues sure. and so EGS is the perfect laboratory to mm. explore not only technique, but also the ideas that surround the yeah. entire project and actually underpin and motivate it. A fantastic, inspiring project. Thank you so much for, Thank you. for telling me about it. And I, I, I look forward to seeing the fruits of it. Thank you. In day three, we tried to bring our various threads together and also cover the remaining authors on our list, including Krasnohorkai, Deserto, Agamben and Benjamin. There was no real conclusion, of course, but the journey was its own reward. And maybe some of our discussions will end up in Petter's next book. But for now, I'll let Petter sum things up in his own words. Petter Sendi, what a privilege. My first thing I want to say is thank you so much. It's been a truly unique and wonderful experience. And I'm, I'm yeah, I'm so grateful. So it's, yeah, it's been a really, really uh, a precious, uh, precious time. Uh, and so we've been discussing um, the politics and erotics of reading. Mm -hmm. So I couldn't think of a better way of phrasing this other than, how was it for you? Hmm. <laughs> well, for me, it was a, a wonderful experience too, uh, because we were a small group of, of people. Uh, we were eight mm -hmm. and uh, we had very intense discussions. Uh, they sometimes went into uh, went in in many directions, but always refocusing mm. on on the topic that that we we shared. Mm. And uh, in a way, this this form uh, that this seminar took in mm. time, the mm. way it unfolded in time, 
uh, I saw it, uh, or I see it retrospectively, as somehow mirroring what we have been discussing about reading. Mm. Uh, what I mean is that we have been discussing reading as a constant uh, breathing, what we've called uh, a diastole mm. and a systole, mm. uh, a dispersion mm. and a gathering on the text. And in a way, our seminar has taken this form too. Yeah. So we had moments of dispersion, mm -hmm. uh, reading, the question of reading took us in many important directions. Mm. And then somehow we always managed to refocus mm -hmm. on the text. And this to me was very nourishing. Mm. You see, I, th I think that there is a maybe something something specific to, to this uh, setting, mm. uh, which is um, obviously what uh, a place like EGS is, is uh, creating, making possible. And it's the fact that people from uh, coming with so different uh, backgrounds, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, one of us is a poet, you're working in music and uh, on endangered languages. Uh, there are people who come from a more traditional philosophical mm -hmm. background. Architect. Architect, mm -hmm. yeah. uh, someone who's interested in, in teaching, mm -hmm. um, someone who works on, on, uh, as a cook mm. and, on, uh, and thinks mm. about cooking. So uh, this could be, it could be a problem, but actually I think it was very, it worked very well. Mm. So there have been undeniably these moments of, of uh, divergence um, and disagreement too, I think. There yeah. have been moments of, of disagreement. Mm -hmm. uh, but in the end, I think we have been sort of uh, swallowed in by the, the, the necessity of the topic. Mm. And this doesn't depend on any of us. Mm. Um, I think not on me either. Mm -hmm. uh, mm. But there, there seemed to be a necessity of um, you know, thinking about what reading means mm. uh, today in, in a sort of uh, historical or genealogical continuity mm -hmm. from ancient times, from uh, figures of readers we found in Plato mm -hmm. and uh, until uh, uh, this text by Agamben, which mm -hmm. we've read in our last session, thinking about the futures of reading mm. on, on the screen as mm. opposed to the, to the book, to the scroll, mm. etc., with highly also speculative moments mm -hmm. like in, in Benjamin, in Hobbes. Mm -hmm. So all this has worked out pretty well. Mm. Um, despite or thanks to mm -hmm. our, our different backgrounds. You know? Yeah, absolutely. And the sort of universal aspect that we are all working on things we're all reading, of course, it's so, um, such a central part of this scholarly process mm -hmm. that therefore the politics and erotics of reading uh, are something that we all experience in our own different ways. And so to, to consider that, it's definitely going to shape, I think, my approach to reading and my <laughs> and my. Yeah, the way I um, consider my reading, and uh, that's, I've got a lot to ponder myself in terms of my actually my own practice, even as I and as I write, of course, um, my PhD thesis, so etc. or whatever else I write. Um, so yeah, it's it's a very very important area, I think, and very interesting. It's been a real privilege to be to be part of it. J'ai un petit question en plus. Oui. <laughs> J'ai une copie de. Tube, oh. en français, <laughs> oui. auriez-vous le signer pour Mais moi Avec grand plaisir. <laughs>
but um, what's prevalent in my mind is is the politics really of, of academia in general, but of this particular context. Politically progressive perspectives have generally been presented and pursued, but the truth is we're in the range of mountains, you know, in a in a hotel and paying fees to to um, attend these seminars. This is not accessible to everyone. And that is a question for the idealism of academia that is all about knowledge and, and aiding humanity in some way to, you know, to, to sort of help in a progressive um, search for a better world, which is drunk talk in many ways, but also very real and desperately needed. There are people uh, suffering right now because of needless political bullshit. So that it's incumbent upon people who have privilege, who are able to think through things and think about things to consider where this is going and to try in whatever forms, whether it's super practical and you know basic solidarity um, or highly abstract in an ivory tower on a mountain somewhere um, to always make sure that we're considering these questions and, and doing our utmost to contribute to building a better world, whatever that means. Okay, bye. And this so. is all about improving my circulation. Yes. To but help uh, things. This is good for me, right? Yes. Let's do it. Okay. Oh man, that is cold. Come here. Oh yeah. It's more than It's much more. Really? Yeah. You sort of feel your. <laughs> that is. I can do this, I can do this. You could do three, you could do three. How's it feeling? It's, it's like my legs are now a separate sort of object. They're getting numb, huh? To my body. But usually you're not supposed to do full submersion. Okay. That's so not part of, can I, rules. you're breaking the rules. <laughs> right. Let's go. Oh man. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, that woke me up, right? Yeah. <laughs> if I had a hangover, I don't anymore. Yeah, I love it. I wonder if there's kniping in the UK. I bet there is. Like, yeah, there probably is. The there's a kniping club. But this one, you would put your head in. Right? Yeah, you're okay. right. Yeah. Okay. You ready? Here we go. Ready, Full head in. 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 That's a different feeling, huh? <sighs> oh. <laughs> he has no response. It's cold, right? <laughs> In the head, it's a whole different thing. <sighs> Take it the view. It is absolutely stunning. And actually, this is a this is something I was gonna say. <laughs> Uh, the other day, I tweeted this, mm. and here seems like a perfect moment to say this. Coming here to EGS, the surroundings, the location here in Sasve is super inspiring, obviously, but it's also humbling in two ways. It's doubly humbling. It's humbling in terms of the, the sheer magnitude of nature and, the, and the, the reminder of the fragile, temporal, um, tiny human body that we are, which is humbling. And it's also humbling in terms of climbing the mountain of scholarship and trying to find us a, a seek out a vantage point in our own little limited way, building on, you know, standing on the shoulders of giants. And that is a truly humbling, doubly humbling privilege to be here. So, wow. Thank you.